Spill the cup. We're here to show you a few of the cool products that we finally have available on the marketplace. One is this 16 ounce Victress Libertas coffee mug and the awesome polo shirts. Don't do that. So the uh, shirts are actually logoed with embroidery. Logoed. And the ones that we have available are 50% cotton and 50% um, polyester. So these aren't the stick-on. They're not the stick-on. No, they're actually sewn they're on. Sewn on. Mugs are $15. We have the long sleeve V-neck lady shirts for $15. These are 20. And I have one jacket left that's uh, a very nice athletic women's jacket that we're selling for 25 that's also my grand. This is getting too long. Visit the marketplace. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, I'm so excited tonight. Our guest is a state superior court judge. She's an author, an advocate of our original republic, and an educator to so many through her website, AnnaVonRitz.com. We're delighted to have to our show tonight, Judge Anna Von Ritz. Hey, Judge Anna, how are you? Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> okay, so Judge Anna, um, we have been fans of yours for so long, and thank you so much for being here. And we would like to start with you and I, like you said, we've been researching this kind of stuff for a long time, but we have a lot of newbies who uh, have joined our channel. And so what we'd like to do is explain to them where we came from, where we are right now, and where we might be going as a civilization. Can you help us with that? Well, I can sure try. Um, basically, things got off track during the Civil War. Now, we have all been taught to call it the Civil War, but it wasn't actually a war. It was a mercenary conflict. And there's a difference. Uh, I guess the, the way to put it is that in a, uh, a lawful war, there's a declaration and there's an end. There's a peace treaty. But in a commercial conflict where you've got mercenaries on both sides, um, it's not that clean cut kind of, of affair. It's, it's, a, um, it's an illegal war, let's put it that way. And it does not have the standing or the repercussions or meaning of a true war. So what happened here in the 1860s was not a war even though that's what we call it, it's not. It's, it's a commercial mercenary conflict. And the reason that we can be sure that that is true is that there was no formal declaration of any war by the Congress ever, and there's no official peace treaty ending it either. Those two things which should be there aren't there. And uh, I can pretty much definitively challenge anybody with a million dollar reward to find an actual declaration by Congress commencing any war or any actual peace treaty ending it. So, and, and I don't want to interrupt, but do we have those on all of these other wars since? Yes. We do. Okay. All right. Good. Um, but it's questionable that those wars were lawful either because the entities that were involved that were actually making these declarations don't appear to be um, lawful um, government entities. They, are, they all appear to be corporations and operating as corporations. And when a corporation, when a government steps down and assumes the character of a commercial corporation, it loses all claim to sovereignty and becomes just another commercial corporation. So it would be like IBM declaring war on GM. Wow. Okay. That sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's sort of a, a, a war by definition. That's kind of a euphemistic thing, like the war on drugs. And right. The, you know, wars on all these other things. War on, on terrorism. <laughs> Yeah. Right, and basically they're just keeping this rolling forward. They're they're pretending that they're 
at war, but they're, you know, no corporation can actually declare a real war. Right. So what they're doing is, is um, basically doing a bunch of legalistic chicanery and um, semantic deceits in order to bring forward these false claims. And uh, essentially the same thing happened with us and with our estates. After the war, um, the, the uh, southern states were in ruins and the northern states were bankrupt, thanks to Lincoln. And the uh, Grand Army of the Republic, which is what they called the Union Army, was in charge under a set of rules that were set up in 1863 called the Lieber Code. Now the Lieber Code has since morphed into the Hague Conventions. And uh, that's another whole story I won't go into, but essentially we have a situation where we have the actual states and the actual people and the actual government that we're owed, which we all think of as the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have the municipal United States, which is a, a government that was uh, allowed to Congress under the original constitution to rule over the uh, Washington DC municipality. Okay, so they were given the, the right to have their own oligarchy take control of Washington DC, which they then parlayed into an international city state. So they have their own little bailiwick over there, which is called the municipal United States. And then finally we have the territorial United States, which is still run by the military. Wow. Okay, and, and we're, we grow up and we're blissfully unaware of all this, right? Right. So we've got three different governments. One, the United States of America, unincorporated. Uh, one, the United States, municipal. And one, the Israel. And all these things are happening all around us all the time, and they're all feeding off of us because they all get their money from us, right? Right. And uh, so we've been carrying around all of these different levels of government, plus county governments, plus municipal uh, governments formed as boroughs, counties, uh, townships, uh, you know, you name it. And, and last but not least, they're trying to foist off a regional government on us too, through the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So, each one of these levels of government goes out and they play a game. It's, it's really kind of funny because uh, what they do is they describe you or they describe your property and they infringe on your common law copyright in order to do it. And by describing, I'll give you an example with, with property. Say that you, uh, your house is identified as uh, 911 Spring Street, okay? And it also has a, another property description that the tax assessor gives it, uh, which might be 19-2014 uh, uh, plat number A, B of the Springfield County plat, okay? Mm -hmm. Or it might be a municipal designation like um, lot 12, block three of the uh, Fairyland Park subdivision, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it, they keep changing all these different descriptions. That's what they're foreclosing on. They're not foreclosing on your house. They're just the, the descriptions, the locations that they have. Ah. Wow. Yeah, they just copyright this description and then they arbitrarily claim that that's theirs and they have the copyright to the description, right? Oh. So they put that in as a title, a title like a title to a book. Yeah. Right. And they foreclose on that title. Huh. Interesting. It's all just chicanery. It's all fraud. And yeah. It's the same thing that they've done with people, though, too, right? Oh, absolutely. Can you, can you go through that a little bit with birth certificates and all that kind of deal? Right. Well, they, they do the same thing with, with the birth certificates. What's supposed to happen is that when a, a baby is born, the parents are supposed to give notice to the community and um, copyright the name, basically nail down the common law copyright of the child's name by recording it. 
notice I said record it. Record is land jurisdiction. Registering anything puts it in the C jurisdiction. Huh. But because our parents didn't know this, weren't told this, they don't do it. You know, they might write your name down in the family Bible, and that does create a record, but that's not a public record of you holding your own name and everything, right? So instead what happens is that the hospital posts your given name in a birth announcement, right? Mm -hmm. And if after however long, a week, two weeks, whatever, your nobody comes forward to claim that baby, the hospital then turns it over as a uh, abandoned vessel, right? Mm -hmm. Abandoned name. And it gets registered by the state of organization, basically Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, you're considered a ward of the state, as if you had been left on the hospital's doorstep, right? So now they've copyrighted your given name. And on your birth certificate, you will see that the actual uh, name is all capital letters, and that's how you uh, name a corporation, a corporate entity. It could be a uh, could be a cooperative, could be an estate, could be a trust of any kind, a foundation, a C corp, S corp, LLC. All of those things are named with all capital letters. So when you see that birth certificate, you'll notice that there's your actual birthday, right? Mm -hmm. And then there is a file date, which is always a few days or a week or two later. Well, the birthday uh, is the record of you being born, right? And the birth date is the record of the thing, the estate or the public transmitting utility uh -huh. or the cooperative or whatever else being registered, right? That's uh -huh. its birth date. Wow. So, is this birth certificate has two functions. Its first function is as a insurance indemnity receipt. When they seize your property, they have to insure you against loss and damage. So when they prolong your property like this and step in as your, it's called a usufruct, where they make use of your assets for their benefit, they have to insure you against loss or damage, okay? So your birth certificate is an indemnity insurance receipt, okay? And the other thing it is, it's a bond. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are confused about what bonds are. A bond is an IOU. Mm -hmm. It has no, no value but what you give it, okay? And they figure out using accounting and actuarial tables uh, how much money you might be expected on average to make in a lifetime, and they bond your estate for that amount. And that includes your labor, whatever you might accrue as a, a homeowner or, you know, stocks, blah, 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 okay? So they, they put out this IOU out there, this bond in your name, the all capitals name, the estate name, and then they sit back and they benefit from trading that, from uh, putting insurance policies and collecting on that. One of the most repulsive things they do is they take your money that you um, spend on taxes and things of that nature, and they take out a life insurance policy on you so that when you die, they get paid. Wow. wow. Incredible. So Judge Anna, do you have a birth certificate or have you remedied this in some way for yourself? Well, because it's an insurance indemnity receipt, it's actually a very good tool for you once you figure out their game. So now you know what a birth certificate is. Okay. Now you go and you get that, that birth certificate authenticated. And that is a process of going to the state secretary of state with a birth certificate and saying, okay, I want your office to authenticate that this is genuine actual birth certificate. Okay, so the state secretary of state goes through and they go, oh yeah, 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 everything checks out. Boom, they stamp it. They put a cover sheet on the birth certificate you got from Vital Statistics. 
And then next you take it to the United States Secretary of State, in this case, Rex Tillerson's office, and you do the same thing. You say, hey, I want this authenticated. And they go through the same process and they put their cover sheet on top of it. So what you get back at the end of the day is the three page document. It has the US Secretary of State's verification that it's a genuine article. You have the State Secretary of State's verification that it's a genuine article. And you have the birth certificate that you got from the vital statistics people. And so you now have, you've kind of, I call it, you've built the lawnmower, okay? You now have the, the, the absolute proof that this is what was done, this is who did it to you, and this is who is liable for having done that to you, all right? Um, that's step one. Okay. So you now have an authenticated birth certificate. And I want to just very briefly, a lot of people have questions. Well, why is it authenticated? Why isn't it certified? Why isn't it apostilled? Okay, well, the plain fact of the matter is, is that there are different conventions that, that different groups of countries have for guaranteeing the authenticity of documents that pass back and forth between them in international business. And so all of the Hague Convention com countries that signed on to the Hague Conventions do act between themselves as for that purpose, for guaranteeing that records are correct. But all the countries that never signed on to the Hague Conventions, including the United States of America, use authentication. Yeah. So that's why when you're acting as an American state national, you are acting under the auspices of the United States of America, not the United States. And that's why you have to authenticate your birth certificate for use in international trade instead of getting an apostille. And, uh, you know, people get very confused and sometimes they get run around because nowadays for a state secretary of state's office to have to do an authentication. Mm -hmm. Some of them bulk at it and say, well, what's that? Mm -hmm. you know, but that's just their ignorance coming out. Okay. And we have to keep on them and make sure that they continue to do their job. So anyway, um, that's why it's an authentication instead of an apostille. And uh, when, you, uh, when you want an authentication, you tell the state secretary of state and the U.S. secretary of state's office that you need it for doing business in Indonesia. Oh. Or one of the other countries that never signed on to the Hague Conventions. And that's really all that's necessary. Okay. So anyway, that's why you get it authenticated. And that's the overall purpose is just to have a... a a copy of the document that is guaranteed to be genuine. Okay. So that you can go into any court and they can't waffle or, or say, oh, well, this isn't quite official and, you know, give you all that other runaround. Okay. Okay, so now you have an authenticated birth certificate. What else do you need? Well, you need to go back and correct that whole business where your parents didn't claim you. Okay you have to go back and claim your own name and estate. And at this point, they have seized upon your trade name and copyrighted that trade name. And by the way, it's, it's the uh, British Crown Corporation that holds the copyright to your trade name. But anyway, they only hold it um, in a secondary capacity because you were born before their franchise was born. You are the holder in due course. You have first dibs. In commerce, it's always first in line, first in time, has the claim. And so you are the true holder in due course of your Christian trade name, which is your first, middle, last, upper and lower case name that you were always taught to use in grade school, right? Mm -hmm. So you go back in and you, tr you claim back your own name. And you do this using a common law um, copyright going back all the way to your birthday okay. and you reconvey your property to the land and soil of the state where you were born now we have a, a form called a certificate of assumed name 
that does all this, plus it gives you a standing writ of habeas corpus established on the public record. And once that's done and it's recorded, then you have control of not only your trade name, but all of the derivative names that were spun off of it. You now have control of the quote unquote straw man name, the all capitals, mm -hmm. first, middle, last. The public transmitting utility name, which is upper and lower case, uh, or it can be all caps with just nothing but a middle initial. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there are all sorts of different variations, every kind of variation you can think. Last name first, first name last, upper, middle, lower case, all caps, with a middle initial, without a middle initial, with this punctuation, with that punctuation. It doesn't matter. These are all, um, they're all different derivatives is what they're called of your trade name. So you claim them all. You claim the whole thing. Okay. Every, your, your, your trade name and every variation possible. Okay, and at the same time, you establish a writ of habeas corpus, and that allows you to go into their courts and take over administratively and basically tell them what to do instead of them administrating your estate and telling you and laying down the law and fining you and putting you in jail. You tell them what you're going to do. You walk in and you say, hey, I'm the subrogee of the defendant. I'm the priority creditor. I am the paramount security interest holder. And guess what? You're not. So now that we have it straightened out about who I am and what my role is, I am owed all the bonds that the prosecutors brought forward and I want all charges eliminated. There's not a thing they can do about it. Boom. Yeah. That's it. And That's this, and this can be done even in the uh, in the c courts that we're brought into. Not not just common law courts. This can be done in. Well, Anna, what, so what happens if, out of ignorance, they don't care and they just throw you throw you in jail anyway, out of force? Well, we have had we have samples of that happening, and there are some very ignorant judges out there. Um, most judges realize that what they're doing in these courts is not anything to do with actual law, mm -hmm. that it's just an administrative process. But there are some that are corrupt and there are some that are ignorant. And mm -hmm. we do wind up with some cases of them um, in one way or another, presuming and imposing upon people under false presumptions and false pretenses. Okay. However, we now have enforcement. Excellent. Tell us about the enforcement. Yeah, because I had heard a, a previous uh, interview uh, with you talking about needing to do this one county at a time. Is that correct? Well, yeah, we still need to do that in order to restore our, our true government to its full function and glory. We need to get our duffs up off the couch and form our it's called a county jural assembly. County jural assembly. Okay. Okay. Now you'll remember in the Constitution it says you have the right to peaceably assemble, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say peaceably associate. So you're talking about a jury assembly, not a jural society, okay? Because the assembly is what forms the court on the land jurisdiction. And we, the living people, are land jurisdiction beings, and we function and control the land jurisdiction of our country. Okay, why are we land assets and, and land beings? Well, number one, we're born on the land. But mm -hmm. number two, from dust thou art dust, and to dust thou returnest. Okay, so we come from the land, and we go back to the land, and as a result, we are land beings and land assets. And guess what? We are owed the law of the land. All right? You have to kind of step back a little bit and think about this in terms of land and sea. Mm -hmm. Land is the national um, jurisdiction. 
okay? And, and what are our nations in this country? Our states are our nations. Every state is a nation. Mm. True. Okay? Yeah. So you are born as a Minnesotan or a Wisconsinite or an Illinoisan or a, a you know, a Texan. Texan. <laughs> Californian or whatever that's that's your nation that's your nationality and more generally of course we call ourselves Americans mm -hmm. but American is is kind of a melding pot term that could apply to anybody in the, on either continent of North or South America right it could be somebody in um, you know Venezuela mm -hmm. so uh, American isn't terribly useful because of that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much more to the point when you're talking about your nationality to look them right in the eye and say, hey, I'm a Minnesotan. I'm a Texan. Interesting, yeah. Huh. Okay, that's my nation. And this is my nation state, okay? The actual land that you're standing on is your nation state. And you have control of your national land jurisdiction. Okay? So that's something that Americans have to remember, too. Uh, over the years, it's become um, very common to consider yourself uh, kind of all together, right? Mm -hmm. That there are no separations or differences, and it's all just one big thing. But that only happens in international jurisdiction. What happened is that the original states... Um, saw the, the benefit of um, delegating some of the responsibilities, combining and then delegating those responsibilities. So what they did is they formed essentially what we would recognize today as a holding company, an unincorporated holding company called the United States of America, okay? Mm, right. This holding company held all of the states' international jurisdiction both on the land and on the sea ah okay and out of this slush pile of international powers right, right. they delegated 19 of those powers to the united states okay mm -hmm. so the united states was a separate government controlled by Britain, all right? They came in here as purveyors of governmental services. Mm. And so their entire role was to come here and provide us with good faith service, to provide us with these 19 services, governmental services, which they are called powers, right? but the exercise of those powers results in a commercial service contract. And that essentially is what the Constitution did. It set up that whole deal where it set up the United States government, right? Set up the commercial service contract, delegated those 19 powers so that that entity could provide those 19 services, right? And the United States of America retained all the different powers that were not specifically enumerated. Huh. Invented, okay? So the USA stands above the US and always has. The United States of America, which is an unincorporated body politic, and an unincorporated holding company has always had the, um, the primary role, the primary role and responsibility over the US. And that's the way it's designed. And that's the way, that's why you have Amendment 10, which says all rights that are not specifically delegated are retained by the states and or the people, right? That's why you have the 10th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, the United States of America, having delegated those powers, 
is in a position to take those powers back if the U.S. fails to live up to its contract, if it welches, if it breaches, if it fails to perform, we have the ability and the responsibility to say, eh, you know, Joe Blow, you had a contract with us. You didn't do it. You didn't do what you said you were going to do. You went bankrupt. We don't accept the successor to you to your bankruptcy. I mean, put yourself in the position of of. Um, um, Okay, I, I liken it to a condo association. You're, you're familiar with how condos work, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have something that looks like a large apartment uh, complex, but every quote unquote apartment in there is actually its own little world, its own little house within this larger framework. Well, it's the same way with the states and the USA, okay? Um, so you go out and you hire somebody to take care of the condominium grounds, the, the jointly shared grounds, right? You got this company that comes in and they trim the trees and they take out the garbage and they do the snow plowing and all that other stuff, right? They provide mm -hmm. these services. Like, does it sound like the 19 enumerated services? Yeah, yeah, yeah it sure does, doesn't it? Huh. So they're out there, they're doing their job, and then boom, that company goes bankrupt. All right. So, what happens? Well, I can tell you what did happen. Uh, the company services went bankrupt, and then another company showed up, was booted up by the same exact people, okay? Another company was booted up. Uh, they changed the, the name slightly. They changed the color of the truck, you know, <laughs> and they come right back in there and they continue doing all of these jobs, right? And if you don't object, then a process of assumption takes place. Mm -hmm. They just assume the contract and they continue on doing the work, but it's a different company. And that's what's been happening here. So who's, who's, so who's failing? Like the Federal Reserve? Ah. Is, is that one of the entities that you're talking about? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and so, and who is in charge of the United States of America that can say, hey, we're firing you. We want to go back to uh, our sovereign ways. Well, essentially that's what's already happened. Oh, yay. Um, back in like 2008, well, actually, let me take it back further. Okay, first we have a company called the United States, Inc., right? Mm -hmm. It goes bankrupt in 1863. Okay. Uh, they reorganize and they spawn another company called the United States of America, Inc. But that's not the United States of America, right. which is an unincorporated body politic. It's a corporation named after us, infringing on our copyright and seeking to deceive people into thinking it's us. Okay? Right. So that would be all capital letters then as well, right? It should have been, but it wasn't. It was upper and lower case, and hmm. it was just identified as an ink, as an incorporation. Okay. Then that went bankrupt in 1907, and guess what? They flipped right around and they introduced the United States of America, Inc., with a small T on the the, they changed the name just a tiny bit. Oh, oh you got to be kidding me. I'm fun. not kidding you. This is the kind of chicanery that we've been dealing with. Okay. Wow. Okay, so the, uh, the company that was formed right after the Civil War, during and after the Civil War, went bankrupt in 1907. The, uh, the perpetrator, the, the next one in line was the United States of America with a small T on the the. And that went from 19, that bankrupted in 1933. So there's a, a period of time there when um, the small T version was operating from 1907 to say 1933. And then it went bankrupt. And then we got the the uh, the United States with United States all caps and that too is another incorporation but this was a municipal corporation 
of the uh, Washington DC Municipal Corporation and, and the District of Columbia. Okay, so you've got all these different providers of these services and they are charging us for all these services, right? Yeah. And they're just running wild. I mean, yes. there, there's nobody minding the store. Right. The, uh, the, the um, service providers are just selling us whatever services they want to provide for us and, and charging us on our estates for all these services that they are just racking up. So, you know, it's gotten to the point where they're, they were um, charging us for the service of incarcerating us. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, so isn't yeah. that, so isn't that what's going on right now though? Yeah, so that's our, what I was going to say. Is that what, is that, is that what our government is right now? There, that's a service for us? Is our government a service for us that we're paying? What, what those rascals, those sermon <laughs> were trying to do. <laughs> this was, isn't true. They were, they were setting up a situation similar to Nazi Germany, where they were going to come in here, they were going to uh, claim all of our property and assets, they were going to kill us off by the millions and collect the life insurance policies on us, and then collect all of the quote-unquote abandoned property, all the dead people, right? Then they leave behind all this abandoned property. Yeah, they were going to set up a concentration camp system and just run us right through it. And then they were going to charge the survivors for all this service they did to accomplish this end. That's incredible. And and most of the people just buy it hook, line, and sinker. Well, I wouldn't have known until it was right on them. Yeah. But thankfully, there were some of us that were awake. And we had seen what went on in Nazi Germany. We recognized the signs of it. And, um, you know, when they got to down to uh, buying millions of body bags and building 800 FEMA camps and started running railroads to them and buying uh, billions of rounds of ammunition and distributing it to uh, privately owned subcontractors like uh, and DARPA and uh, yeah. FBI and... Yeah. FEMA and all these other alphabet soup agencies, which are not government, they're just subcontractors of government. Uh, then we raised our hands and we said, now, enough of this. This is not going to happen. We're going to expose you from here to breakfast and go after you. So this happened around 2008, is that what you're saying? Well, what happened is all this started um, actually with the end of the bankruptcy of the United States of America incorporated with the small T version that FDR booted up okay. or bankrupted back in 1933. That came out of bankruptcy in 1999. Mm. And at that point, we raised our hand and said, eh, hey guys, we're going home. We're back on the land and we're not messing around with you anymore. And the next 20 years were various uh, actions that were taken to object. Now it was during this time that we went all the way to Rome and banged our dish on the floor like angry dogs and, and uh, wound up talking to the Pope and doing all sorts of other things. And getting all sorts of, of uh, paperwork done at the Hague and various groups around the country got organized to resuscitate their counties and their states and all this has been going on I mean it, it's been happening here for 20 30 years and it just has gotten to the critical mass where enough people are informed so that they're concerned and they're actually taking uh, a much more serious view and, and taking personal action and during that time the um, the abuses of the courts and of the um, police and um, the the subcontracting agencies have gotten worse yes and the propaganda on the tv and, and radio has gotten worse yeah. and the um shall we say the cognitive dissonance between all the yankee doodle dandy land of the free stuff and the actual uh, gut-wrenching fear that many people have felt uh, when approached by the IRS or the FBI mm -hmm. or some of these other agencies like BATF. 
um, it, it all sounds very hollow all of a sudden, doesn't it? You realize that you're being coerced and you're being victimized and that your rights are not being respected and that these people are on your soil causing trouble for you and you are employing them. Right. right. Okay. So, you know, since when does my gardener get to boss me around? I would like to know just exactly what is the basis of this premise that you think you can come in here and tell me what to do when I'm paying your salary? Hello, America! Yeah, so Anna, let's circle back real quick because I don't think a lot of people, well, some people don't understand that. That So the, the our court system is, we're talking about admiral time law, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, maritime. Maritime, I'm sorry, maritime law. Okay, if you think about it in terms of land and sea, maritime is the intersice between the actual sea and the land, right? There's that, that intertidal zone, that's maritime, that's commerce. That's the Merchant Marine Service, okay? You heard of the Merchant Marines? Mm -hmm. Okay, these guys um, have their own law, their own yep. thing going right. on. Right, right. Then you have Admiralty. That's the high seas. That's out away from that intertidal zone where you're actually out um, outside of any country's sphere of influence um, and you're in true international jurisdiction and you know that's all under the queen ah oh right so do we have that here in the united states absolutely okay it, it, that's part of our court system now correct our the legal well, system it's part of their system right and we, wound, we wind up not we get sucked into their court system right. via their franchises Have, have you ever studied magic at all or any of that at all? Because there's a, a thing in, in, in the uh, tradition of magic called a poppet, like a voodoo doll. Yes. Well, the straw man functions like a poppet or a voodoo doll. It, they use it like a handle to grab hold of your assets and control you and your assets without actually addressing you and that's how they get away with it because there's no law against raping pillaging murdering and and stealing from a corporation a fiction right and they're all dealing in fiction so no you know you can't you can't say oh you you harmed my fiction because a fiction doesn't exist right so how do you bring them back into reality you claim the copyright to your trade name and all of its derivatives and all of its punctuations and all of its variations. And then you sit back and you go, hey, I'm the subrogate. I'm the priority creditor. So basically you're saying claim yourself back. Yes. Claim your name and estate. Your estate is, is attached to your name. So, so let me get this right. So right now, uh, according to the government, we're, we're just corporations. Each, we're individual corporations. You died a long time ago. Corpse, right. All that's, yeah, all that's left of you is your estate. You haven't okay. been heard from since you left that hospital. Is that how they get away with uh, uh, get, uh, extorting federal income tax from us as well? Um, because we're a corporation instead yeah, of an so individual? Because, because uh, yeah. 100%. The income tax applies only to corporations. In mm -hmm. fact, the word income mm -hmm. is specifically and only applicable to corporations. So if there's an income tax, it's against a corporation. By definition, it cannot be a tax against a living being. Yeah, and I, I believe in the 77,000 pages of the IRS code, not one time do they define what income is, because they can't. Well, it has been defined by the Supreme Court as capital, what, what was it? Capital Profits gain. Profits from, from capital. Okay? Yes, yes. But, you know, the real shtick here is that income applies to corporate accruals. I corporate mean, accruals. by definition, it applies only to corporate 
accrual. So once somebody claims back their name, the IRS won't even mess with them or they may possibly try to intimidate them. What is your take on it? Well, they'll try anything. Yeah. But these are just private bill collectors. They have no right. government authority. Right. They're field private bill collectors. Um, let me give you a little rundown on, on the history of the, of the income tax. It began in the 1100s in France and England, and it was called Peter's Pence. It was an income tax that was um, created by the Roman Catholic Church to pay for the Crusades. And it was collected by their specific bill collectors who were black robed men who wore white wigs. They were called galley and they were priests of the pagan goddess Sibyl. They came to Rome in the second century BC and they've been bill collectors for the popes and the Roman pontiffs ever since. Huh. Okay, so on the 15th of every April, they would come around and they would collect hmm. an income tax called Peter's Pence. And they're still doing the same thing now. Only they're doing it through the Internal Revenue Service, and they are using judges and barristers. And you'll note that the British barristers still wear white wigs, yeah. just like the galley. Yep. So it, it's all connected all across the history. And if you start studying the history, you'll see that nothing much has changed. Mm -hmm. And that income tax is, has been illegal in America, ever, but it's not illegal in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You see? Uh, yes, right. Yep. Okay. So they can't charge us, the living people, anything, but they can charge our corporate person yeah. however much they want, as long as you let them have a corporate person. And, and you also educated me a little bit via email. Um, I mean, there are specific names that people need to really pay attention to, such as person, man, woman, and human. So I wasn't aware of the human. Would you tell our audience what human means? It means hue of man the um you know just like a color has a hue mm -hmm. okay color all right. man all right so it, it means the color of man uh in the sense of color of law yes. it appears to be a man but isn't and um so you don't want people calling you a human because uh, among other definitions that you'll find if you look in old admiralty law dictionaries and stuff you'll see that uh, one of the definitions of a human is a monster, right? Like a straw man, mm -hmm. right? Okay, something that appears to be a man but isn't. And so, you know, what immediately comes to my mind is Sasquatch. You're not even sure it exists, but if it does, does it have rights? Yeah. Mm. And why should it have rights? Maybe it's dangerous. Maybe, maybe it's actually an animal. It only appears to be a man, right? Wow. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm for animal rights and that I don't think anything should be cruelly treated, right? But I'm, I'm not going to go out and stand there and, and uh, stake my rights on a claim that is questionable. I, I want my natural and unalienable God-given rights. Thank you. Yeah. Anna, f this is fascinating information. When did you start, when were you awakened? When did you start studying this? I started studying this back in the 70s when I caught a, um, a broadcast. And I, I always thought it was C-SPAN, but it couldn't have been C-SPAN. It must have been the predecessor C-SPAN uh, because it was during the, um, the confirmation hearings for Nelson V. Rockefeller as Jerry Ford's vice president. And I was home one day watching TV and I just happened to turn on the TV and there the, you know, the committee was all seated in the rotunda and they were talking to Nelson D. Rockefeller asking him questions and the question came up. Uh, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money did you make last year in personal income? He said something like, oh, 480 million. It was, I don't recall exactly, but it was a lot. 
back then. I mean, it was sure. pretty a dropping amount of money. And uh, then the next question was, and, and how much federal income tax did you pay? And he, he stood there just as stony faced as you please, and he said, none. Yeah. Wow. Okay, and so you could kind of sense and, and hear the, the breath going <laughs> out of the room, right? Yeah. And then the uh, chairman of the committee who was doing the questioning kind of fussed around in a chair a little bit and leaned over and he said, I really understand that you made $480 million in blah, blah, blah income and you didn't pay any taxes, any federal income taxes at all. And Nelson just kind of sat back in his chair and said, none. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So they have known about this game so, for a long time. So Those... a light bulb went up at that point, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, this little girl in Wisconsin was sitting there going, let's see, uh, I just paid a third of my my little waitress's paycheck to yeah. the federal government for all these different federal taxes. And he made that kind of money, and he paid zero, none. I want to know what he knows. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, okay. And so then this, this takes waiting through the federal code and it is literally code yep okay so this federalese language uh is the probably the very worst gobbledygook on the planet that you're ever going to read the irs code yes and throughout the irs code to as a non-resident alien and for most Americans, it would never ever occur to them that they were by any means a non-resident alien. I mean, that's like you're talking about someone who comes over from Mexico and does a day trip and goes back home, right? That's a mm -hmm. non-resident alien. Huh? Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. But that's what the federal, law, federal code uses to refer to us. Right. And you have to flip it around on its head and yeah. look at it from their perspective as a foreign government. Yes. Okay, they're a foreign government and with you're reading their code now, you are a non-resident alien. Mm -hmm. So first you have to catch on to things like that as you're reading this gobbledygook, which is you know deliberately and horribly deceptive and convoluted and yeah. Just yes. utterly messed up. Yeah. Intentionally. Yeah. Right. So I, I slogged through 125,000 pages of that. And by the time I got done with that, I had an education in federalese. And um, so I, um, I, I still was clinging to my uh, rather naive belief in America, land of the free, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was being bamboozled somehow, and I had a pretty good idea that it wasn't good and that it was something that I, you know, had caught on to some of it. And at that time, let's see, this is probably about 20 years afterward, I was um, running a commercial art gallery. And my husband's an artist. He's a very fine artist. He's a, a member of the um, oil painters in America. So, he, you know, he's up there and has been for a long, long time. We had our own art gallery. So I was a good little person. I made up all these questions about a, a change that we were looking at, an expansion for our business. And I had questions about how that would affect taxation. And I took all these questions into the local IRS office and made an appointment with the top dog at the IRS office. And I went into the office and asked all these questions, and got answers, and wrote them down. And at the end of the interview, I said, okay, well, I think I understand this. Um, would you go back over and, and just quickly read the, uh, the question and the answer you gave me and initial it? Did I have it right? Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Yeah, no. Oh, no, we, there can't be any accountability. <laughs> no, they didn't want that. That would be like going to, uh, say, Department of Natural Resources and, and uh, walking into their office and saying, uh, when is moose season this year? <laughs> right. And they say, well, it's, you know, September 30th to October 10th. Right. 
and you ask them to write that out and confirm that or give you something to prove that, yeah. and they won't. Right. And I knew right there and then, any, any doubt, any lingering suspicion that I could be wrong and that maybe this was actually something legitimate, this income tax stuff, I knew. Wow. I thought <laughs> I knew that it was a scam. Yeah. And that was the most horrifying, scary moment that you can think of. It was like being at the top of a really tall roller coaster and having the bottom go out. So this was so you. This is a scam in the tax system, and then you you started learning more. Then right at oh. that point, <laughs> so much more, right? And it didn't get better, did it? No, it just got worse and worse and worse, and. Uh, you know, the path led up and down and all around and into different areas. Um, I found out that as a result of the 1907 bankruptcy, all of our land had been held as um, surety for that bankruptcy. They came in and they laid claim to all of our land and they parceled it out either as residential, industrial, or agricultural and they took a title on all that land, all of it, as uh, a surety for the bankruptcy that started in 1907. When that bankruptcy of 1907 settled in 1953, the rats said, oh, well, we can't possibly know who this land actually belongs to anymore. So they put it into two giant land trusts. Department of Agriculture, and one went to the Interior Department. The private land that had been private land uh, was glommed up by the Department of Agriculture, and the public lands was glommed up by the Department of the Interior, and that was managed by by Bureau of Land 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 Management. Okay, so actually, they took title to all of our land as surety for their debt. And then they made a false claim of abandonment and rolled it all over into trust. Hmm. Okay. And they continued to hold the title. Okay. Yeah. So they, they stole by this chicanery, which it's nothing but open fraud. Okay. Right. And then they pulled the same thing with our labor, our labor assets and our, our private personal property with the 1933 bankruptcy. That's when they stole our, our actual silver dollars, our labor, the value of our labor, our, our names, all of it. They uh, used all that as surety for their debts too. And they, um, they, they've just been nothing but a bunch of, of you know, rotten, criminal, no good, who is it? Uh, so, it? Is it is it the Crown? Is it the Rockefellers? Is it the Rothschilds? Who actually started all of these scams? Well, there are actually two colluding game uh, gangs. I'll call them involved. Yeah. There's a Dutch gang and there's an English gang, and that started all this. And then over time, uh, the the Dutch gang included some French elements. So we we've got. Basically, we've got Western European country uh, corporate governments in here fooling around with us and, and trying to um, seize upon um, our assets via this legal chicanery. All right. So these bankruptcies that you're talking about, is, are these from mismanagement or are these planned bankruptcies? These are planned bankruptcies. They happen in a cyclic fashion about every 70 to 80 years. And they're set up so that they can discharge their debts against us, mm -hmm. leave us holding the bag for their debts. Mm -hmm. And so we become indebted for their debts and they continue to hold us as wards of their state or their, uh, their next generation uh, service provider. Is it is it a possibility that this might happen again? And I, I, it seems like uh, now, what are we, $20 trillion in debt? 
Uh, and is, is this money being offshored? Yeah, I know, <laughs> more than $20 trillion. <laughs> Okay, what they're talking about there with that, that $20 trillion thing is their debt. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not our debt, it's their debt. Right. Right. It's, and so now the next question is, okay, they're $20 trillion in debt, so who's holding the credit? Right. 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 Because in a debt credit system, every time that you pay a debt with a debt, what happens? You create a credit, right? You mm -hmm. never actually get paid in this system until you foist off those those debt notes on someone else. Okay, so a credit is created for one party and a debt is created for the receiving party. It's backwards of anything that you normally think of, all right? Because you're trading a debt. It's like a negative number. Mm -hmm. I'm holding a negative seven and I give you that negative seven as a, um, a payment. So now you've got negative 30, right? You got negative $30 in your pocket. And yet we're spending this as if this were real and as if this made any sense, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't. It's, it's just a bookkeeping fiasco is all. But you know that if there's a $20 trillion debt, somebody's holding the other side of that as a, as a $20 trillion credit. But you never hear about the national credit, do you? Right. Well, the answer is, is that you're holding the, the, the $20 trillion credit and they're just not doing their bookkeeping and bringing the two sides of it together to zero it out. It's, it's bookkeeping um, fraud, essentially. Uh, the big, I mean, the issue here is, I see, is that they're saying that, they're not saying it's their $20 trillion in debt. We're saying, hey, we're, bit, we're a team here and you owe $20 trillion as well. And and they extort money from us in taxes to try to pay off this debt. But they've already received that. There is no debt. Think of it. What happens? Um, is it possible to have a transaction that doesn't zero out absent a contract stipulating otherwise? I mean, I go to the store, I buy $10 worth of gas, right? Right. I give them the $10, they give me the gas, right? Mm -hmm. It zeroes out. Right. On one side and $10 on the other, and there you go. Right. right? So this idea that there can be a, a $20 trillion national debt without there being a $20 trillion national credit is bogus. It always has been. And yet they pump this up no end, you know, trying to make an excuse for why the American people should, um, you know, pay it again or accept higher taxes or whatever else. And it's just nothing but BS. Mm -hmm. And so that's, it's bookkeeping. It's dishonest bookkeeping. And it began as a result of fast Eddie O'Hara. Fast Eddie O'Hara was Al Capone's bookkeeper. And he set up a new bookkeeping system, which is known as cooking the books or keeping two sets of books, mm -hmm. double accrual uh, bookkeeping instead of carriage bookkeeping. And guess who adopted Fast Eddie O'Hara's bookkeeping system in 1946? <gasps> the United the government <laughs> the general accounting office switched over to double accrual bookkeeping and they haven't kept a straight set of books ever since so they were indicting these people but then they said hey that's a good idea what they're doing all right but um, we'll indict them and then we'll do what they're doing all right pretty incredible Yep, the FBI found out about Al Capone's bookkeeping system in the 20s, and by 1946, the government uh, corporations had adopted it. So nice. what we've talked about up till now is pretty bleak, but there's good news, right? In the, do you see good news in the future? Uh, there's been an, a, an awakening, right, in, here in the last 10 years or less? Well, let's see. An awful lot of people have started taking charge of the IRS. And they're no longer the bully boys they were as a result. Because when you're well informed and well armed and you know where the bear went in the buckwheat and you know how to write a letter, 
you can claim your exemption and kick them right out of your life. And you can even do it 10 years retroactively. Hmm. You have no obligation unless you are a federal employee or a federal dependent. And basically what that means are there are certain, there are certain people that are legitimately federal citizens. Right. People who are in the military, military dependents, federal civilian employees, their dependents, uh, people that are really legitimately, truly wards of the state, like, like people who are in insane asylums. Um, you know, this is who this applies to. And also, unfortunately, which is how this all began, black Americans. After the Civil War, they were never granted actual state citizenship. The uh, rotten, no good governmental services corporation that booted up in the wake of the Civil War came in and claimed title to the black slaves that had been, uh, the plantation slaves that had been supposedly freed. Wow. The British Crown came right back in after the fact claim title to them. And what happened is that although private slave ownership was outlawed, public slave ownership had just begun. And it was actually from that that all the rest of this has happened. Okay. Because we were not sharp enough to figure out what these rats were doing and object to it and put a stop to it. They enslaved, they re-enslaved the black people, the plantation slaves, as public slaves. Then they extended this to all federal employees after us. Mm. And they've been able to work this by controlling the, uh, the courts and by controlling the uh, banks. Talking about banks, what do we see as far as the, uh, the, the future of the monetary system? Yeah, I would like your opinion on cryptocurrencies and the cashless society that we see inevitably coming in. Well, okay, I don't believe in money. I never have. To me, it's a ridiculous concept. It's, it's just absolutely stupid. You know, give me this little piece of metal stamped with something on it and tell me that that's worth three bushels of wheat. Yeah, right, to who, how, what? Right. This makes no sense. And I, I used to go around and around and around with one of my friends about the paper in your wallet. And I'd take it out, I'd have this bill in front of them, and I'd say, look, this is just paper. Right. I mean, it doesn't even make good toilet paper. You can't write a note on it. It's useless. It's worthless. What, you know, what are you doing? What are you thinking? You're, you're slaving your life away for this? Right. Mm -hmm. Stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it is. It's, it's just more flim flam. It's more, well, I call it idolatry because what happens is people don't have the sophistication and the discernment to make a distinction between a symbol of value and actual value. Whatever it is that's being used as the symbol of value become synonymous with the actual value in their minds. Right. And that is, that's a logic mistake of major proportions that then uh, offers the opportunity for flim flam artists and, and con men to come in and profit themselves. And so I think the entire concept of money is useless. And I, I think that this is just part of a greater problem in that I keep encountering people who can't think, and because they can't think, they can't feel, and because they can't feel, they can't properly value anything. Hmm. And this is a scary, gigantic problem worldwide. Now, if you stop and you, you observe, you know that you never feel anything except from what you think. Thought always precedes a feeling. You have to think something in order to feel anything, okay? Well, if your thinking is wrong, your feeling is wrong, all right? And if your thought and your feeling is wrong, then you don't have a basis 
to judge the value of anything. I mean, how else can it be that we don't value a human life? Yes. How is that even possible? Exactly. It's because our, our head is screwed up. It's because our feelings are not there as they should be. I mean, we it's have to good. retrain ourselves to think, which will then allow us to feel. And when we get our thinking and our feeling together, then we'll be able to look around and say, oh, what's really valuable? Why that is that? Yeah, I, I that mean, ensures a proper action. Whenever your thinking is correct and your feeling is correct, then the correct action follows. Yes. Yeah, right. I agree 100%. Our value system is all screwed oh, up. Yeah. I completely agree with that. And what's important and our Absolutely. priorities are messed up as well. However, I, I was just, you know, somebody in Cambodia or somebody in China, I might want their product. So how do you do commerce without money? In that but, sense. You know, we've only had one quasi-successful monetary system in the history of the world, and that was based on precious metals. Yeah. Right. But the problem with that, as I said, is that people mistake the symbol of value for the value. Mm -hmm. Right. And th whatever you choose, whether it's gold, silver, or peanuts is the standard of value. Whatever commodity you choose as to establish that uh, benchmark against, okay, is going to be subject to hoarding and yeah. manipulation of all kinds right. and counterfeiting and right. blah, 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 blah. And also you're going to set up a situation where whoever has that particular commodity is going to dominate and control and, and benefit and everybody else is going to suffer. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's OPEC with the oil or it's the Queen of England uh, with the gold or if it's, you know, Joe Schmo who's controlling all the Telluride. It, it just doesn't matter as long as it's based on a commodity or even a basket of commodities. This is the kind of, of runaround we get. And we also have the problem of inelasticity. And I don't know if you ever stopped to think about that, but one of the big things that happened in the 19th century was that gold and silver, there's only so much. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result, these problems um, accrue when the need for a medium of exchange exceeds the supply of that. And so coming out of the 19th century, the big drive toward the fiat currency is that fiat currency is elastic. You can print more of it right. to meet the demands of the marketplace. Exactly. So you, you can have more of these little symbols running around serving the needs of all the people, right? Right. Okay, so I think all of this is crazy. To me, it's like, we might as well go out at midnight and go out to the tool shed and open up the door and go <laughs> down to the hole. Oh, no, I, mean, I, I agree that we need to simplify things. So, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, Angie and I have some property up north a little bit with a cabin and uh, some acreage, a few acres, not too much. But I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a very simple life and it's recharging and it's what we love to do. Yeah. Now, uh, I've said for years that uh, the majority of the people on this earth um, bow down to a green God that is the dollar bill. And I'm like, they, their whole life revolves around it and they worship that. And I'm like, what is going on? It's idolatry. Yeah. It literally is. And yeah. that's what great abomination is about. It all started in um, the ancient kingdom of summer where the Queen Semiramis started doing this. Um, the Sumerians had a lot of grain. And in order to trade, they would have to take baskets of grain from one part of wherever to another. And they were constantly moving all this grain around, right? So she noticed that a basket of grain was trading for the same as a, a little gold coin in the marketplace. So she had these little gold coins made and stamped them with a, a basket of wheat, right? And so this, this came to symbolize a basket of wheat in trade. 
Huh. I guarantee that there was a basket of wheat in the Sumerian treasury to, to back up this little gold coin, right? Right. And then the, we had the Sumerian version of inflation, where suddenly it's the same little gold coin, but there are two baskets of wheat on it. <laughs> done it. And then finally, there's three little baskets of wheat stamped on the same size coin. And finally, the entire coin is covered with itty bitty tiny baskets of wheat, you know? Right. So, this is what all this is about. It's, it's idolatry. It's, right. it's yeah. symbolism that, that, for whatever reason, most humans are not able to grasp the symbolism. They, they don't get it. And so that opens up the, the possibility of a bunch of shysters getting in there and con men. Uh, who disconnect the the medium of exchange from the actual fact of yeah. what is supposedly being exchanged. So, then you get the reason that, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, well, I'm, I'm just saying the only way that you can have a possibly a possibly honest system is to include the value of all commodities and all labor and all natural resources roll it up in one big wad and let your currency worldwide symbolize that because otherwise what happens is the same thing that you get with the commodity markets. If you're a producer of a commodity, then you have an unfair advantage in the commodity markets. And it doesn't matter what commodity it is because you can sell futures, you can hedge your bets, you can set your prices, you can get together with your buddies and manipulate the market if you have enough market share. Yeah. I mean, there are all sorts of things you can do with commodities if you're a producer, but if you're not a producer, you're just a goat. And so we have a situation where we have some countries that have a lot of labor, but don't have a lot of natural resources, right? right. right. And they're the goats. They're always the ones that are standing behind the, the eight ball here. Yeah. And in order to have a, a world that's really thriving and healthy and everybody has what they need and you don't have poverty, starvation and disease and all the miseries that we currently have, is, this, is if everybody can bring something to the marketplace and be a producer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we would set up a system where all of these elements that we trade were included and were part of the quote unquote basket of commodities, including labor, then we could have an honest currency. But until we do that, we're going to have a situation where it's all this chiseling and, and manipulation and hoarding and you know insanity that has gone on for thousands of years. It's 8,000 years since Semiramis stamped her little basket of wheat on a gold coin wow. and we still haven't figured out a better way and it just strikes me as ridiculous yeah. that with as much brain power and as much um, technology and everything else that we have now that we haven't been able to figure our way out from the tool shed mm -hmm. and stop worshiping the tool and start worshiping the you know stop worshiping the, the stop worshiping the creation start worshiping the creator amen you know I, I keep on saying as long as man is governing man we're never going to have a perfect system and that's just the way it is because inherently people are greedy and they're selfish the need and greed system is what we've got now yeah. and what we need is a system that is fair and transparent and honest yeah. and which allows people to trade Honestly, we trade. Yeah, and but everybody has something of value that they should be able to trade. Everybody does. I mean, you can find something within yourself, but it challenges people to find out what is you know what they have that they can bring to the table. My belief is everybody has something that they can bring. Yeah, well, this is a world of abundance, and there is no way that one person should ever go to sleep hungry or no. without a bed, or without no. shelter. Never. No. It should it's, not happen. It's actually a blasphemy, because we were given this wonderful world, this incredible amount of abundance. And if anybody's starving or going without, it's because of us. It's because yes. we messed up. It's because we're not doing our job. We're not sharing. We're not figuring things out. Because it certainly it was not any lack in our environment. No. Yeah. I agree. 
Wonderful. So what is your, what is your advice to people? I know, first of all, I would say the birth certificate, claim your name back. And after that, what are the next steps that you would suggest people take? Claim your land back too. Um, they, they, I was talking earlier about how they just come by and they arbitrarily assign a name and a number or whatever a description to your land. Now, I found out about this in a really strange way. You know, God has prepared me all along the way. He keeps putting these things in my face. I was out in my front yard one day, one summer day, and uh, this little white car pulled up in the ditch in front of my house, and this young lady got out of the car, and she had her clipboard. And so I wandered over there, and I said, hi, what are you up to? She says, oh, I'm out of signing street numbers. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, no, you know. <laughs> right, that's her job. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, and I talked to her a little bit, and she explains that she's been hired to go out and, and assign street numbers to all these parcels. And she's just arbitrarily going along, uh, well, I think I'll call that one 2366 South Park Road, and, and this one over here I'll call 2390 South Park yeah. Road. Yeah, yeah. Well, does it really matter? I mean... No, it doesn't matter. It could be 400, you know, Birchwood Park if you want. You know, she's just arbitrarily out there assigning a name to the street and a number to the, the house parcel, right? This really gets my wheels running because I'm thinking, let's see, I, 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 this isn't the way my land was described on my deed or my, you know. Yeah. And then I get to digging into it more and I find out, well, let's see, there's a plat description. There's a lot and block description. Yeah. There's a street number description. Uh, you know, and I'm paying for all of this. I'm paying at some level something for all of it. Mm -hmm. So this is just another scam. <laughs> this, is, this is calling it a birthday cake, an anniversary cake, and a... Um, a, a, a Merry Christmas cake, okay? <laughs> yeah. And, and you're getting to pay for all these different cakes, right? Yeah. So that all of these different entities can feed off of you. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that when they took title to our land, they took our land out into international jurisdiction. And in order to get our land back, to actually own our land, we have to get our own political status straightened out and identify ourselves as, you know, actual American state nationals because U.S. citizens can't own land in the states. Wow. Okay, so first and foremost, you have to get your own estate and your own name back. All right. And then you can go in and you can get your land back. You can reclaim your land. And... Um, the way you do that is by doing a meets and bounds survey, a physical survey. You actually attach the description to the physical um, boundary stones or boundary markers of your land, just like they did back in the, the day, right? Yeah. And so you do the meets and bounds and you correct the deed. You do a deed correction, you give the meets and bounds description, which is a physical land description, and you rename it, and you copyright the name. So, for example, I paid off anything I owed on my piece of land, Okay. and I did a deed correction. I just did it by the meets and bounds description. You know, using boundary markers, in my case, colored boundary markers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, then I, I just arbitrarily, arbitrarily um, renamed it 4711 Birchwood Road and did my little C with a, a circle around it, my copyright mark, and recorded that. Huh. And that was that. And all you, 
I gave a copy to the, the tax assessor's office. I went over to the tax assessor's office. I gave them a copy of my corrected deed. I had them date stamp in a copy for me so that I could prove I had actually registered it with them in terms of telling them what I'd done, right? Yeah. And then I recorded that. And where did you record that? With the land recording office. And so does that mean that you no longer have property taxes? I no longer have property taxes, but I hadn't had property taxes for a number of years prior to that. But for a totally different means and, and methodology and, and rationale. Now, most of us get a property tax bill every year, and we assume that this is for services rendered, right? Right. Uh, well, we you know we think about oh snow plowing and and sanding the roads when they're icy and cutting the uh, you know ditches and and you know keeping the utility lines clean all these different kinds of things fire service areas blah blah that are are provided by the government the local government right yeah okay. so I'm this is years ago. Before I, before I did the meets and bounds, before I corrected the description, before I bearded the tax assessors in their dens, and before I straightened out my own name and reclaimed my own estate, um, I went to the uh, property tax unit at the local government and I said, okay, well, you're providing me with all these services, but I don't have a contract with you. So I want to straighten this out. I want to know exactly what I'm paying for. And, you know, I, I want to look around here as if I'm getting rooked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. So give me a list. That's me a, the services you're providing and how much it, it's costing me. And, yeah. and I'll contract with you for those services I want. And, and we'll just do this as a business deal. Yeah, you know? I, li I like it. <laughs> And they so, couldn't do it. Let me guess. <laughs> they they didn't reply. Uh -huh. Thirty days later, I sent them another registered letter. You know, yeah. hey, I made you this offer. You know, I, I realized that you are providing services. I don't want to be unfair or cheat anybody or anything. I just, I you know, I made the offer to look over the services you provide and, and that makes sense for me. Nothing. Zero. No. You, your pins drop. Nothing at all. No reply. 30 days after that, I write them back and say, okay, well, I made this offer and yeah, I haven't heard from you, so I have to assume that you're not interested in contracting to provide services to me. And any services that I receive, I will accept free gratis. And they never contacted you again? Well, that's awesome. We're going to do that. We certainly are. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is all fascinating stuff. Sorry we're keeping you so long. I just, uh, you know, I knew I knew I was going to be asking a lot of questions and we're getting a lot of information. I do have a couple of other questions. Uh, the right to travel and tolls. Uh, what can we do about that? Yes. You know, I mean, it doesn't seem like tolls should be uh, legal. Not if they, okay, here's the deal with tolls. They sell off an interest in a, a road that has been funded by public funds to a private investor and yes. they put up a toll for the use of that road. Now the question is, did the people that sold that road have the right to do so? And do they have the right to the land underneath the road? And the answer is almost always no. <laughs> no. So it's all, it, it's another bogus you know, make a buck scam by the corporations. Okay, so that that's something that will probably be done away with here, but not a real high priority at the moment. Right. Um, the other thing, the uh, right to travel, you have the absolute right to travel. Uh, the motor vehicle code was never designed to do anything to interrupt that ever. Uh, the motor vehicle code was excused, and the excuse for the motor vehicle code was public safety uh, and the use that 
certain companies get out of public roads to make private profits. For example, a, a taxi cab company or a um, long distance trucking firm yes. or a courier service would be right. examples. These guys make their living off of using a public resource, right? right. right. And so that's why they were taxed and that's why they were regulated and that's why they were licensed. Anytime you have a license, you are applying to do something that would otherwise be illegal. Right. Right. That's they, right. Because they are drivers of vehicles, correct? Yeah, they are. They're, they're doing this as a, um, a profession. Yes. Mm -hmm. To make money. Yes. That's benefiting from a public resource. Right. right. Okay. That's not fair. Right. 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 But me going down to the grocery store, that's just me going down to the grocery store. That's me pri in my private little vehicle going to the grocery store for my private business. It has nothing to do with making any profit off of anybody or anything. It's just me traveling. Mm -hmm. And they have no right to say boo about that. Nobody has any right to say boo about that. So you're right. You have the absolute right to travel. Now, I have kind of mixed emotions about driver licensing in that I don't approve of licensing it, mm -hmm. you know, for, for Joe Average. But on the other hand, I do want to see some degree of responsibility that people should know the rules of the road. They shouldn't be just willy-nilly out there, you know, ignorantly yeah. stumbling around without any training. Sure. So I think that if you're going to use public roads, you should have some training and some capability at a, at a you know, level. You should be able to pass a, a driving test, okay? Yeah. But after that, I don't think that, if, that you should be licensed. I think you should have an ID, and that should be it. Um, technically, we're only required to give our name and our address as an identification. So now people come to me all the time because they're, they're being harassed, you know, they're being pulled over and they're afraid of being pulled over and they're afraid of the police and blah, blah, blah. Well, it's actually their own darn fault because you can, well, in my case, I just put a little label on my driver's license and that flags them right there. Okay. I'm not a federal citizen. I'm not using the roads for any you know, profit gain. Okay. I'm retired from all that. Yeah. Okay. So I have a little label front and back on my driver license, which says retired. That's it. Bye folks. And anybody at any age can retire from any obligation of citizenship. Citizenship cannot be imposed upon a person against their will. It is a major league war crime to do so involving piano wire around your neck and firing squads. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they cannot impose citizenship on you. They cannot steal your nationality. You know, you are actually holding the cards. You just don't know that you're holding the cards. Yeah. And it's the same thing with your car. You are exempt. Your private vehicle, your private car, your auto is exempt. If you say it is, if you get Z plates, the regulation of the vehicle code that exempts your, your own car, your truck that you're not using for commercial purposes mm -hmm. is regulation Z. So you go to the DMV and you say, I want Z plates. And they have a little sticker. It's a black and white sticker. It says Z, and it has a number, right. and you put it on just like you put on other tags, other, you know, the renewable tags, right? This is a one-time only. Put it on, boom. That identifies it as a private car that you're claiming your exemption, and then they won't bother you. And any state offers this? How much do the Z plates cost? They cost a little bit more than the um, renewable, 
I paid two hundred dollars for mine. Okay. And normally, I would be paying one sixty, say a year. And anybody can apply for a Z plate, any a American, sticker. Any American. Oh, so we have to go through what you went through to become our. No, no they will give you Z plates. They'll give you Z plates anyway, because it doesn't matter. And then do you have to get your car inspected and get the tags renewed and all that? It, mm, well, and if no. anybody gives us a hard time, we're going to tell them that Anna told us we could. Call, call Judge Anna. Call Judge Anna because she said we could. Just look up the motor vehicle. Code. No, I, but no, I'm doing it. I'm of doing course it. we're doing by it. By the, by the way, this is so much information. Like each, I'm taking notes. Yeah, <laughs> each one of the, we're going to have to have you back on multiple times, if you would, please. She's Get, got limited time, though. I know. Each one of these subjects is like a, at least two hours long. So we're just, we have just touched the service on a lot of these things, which brings me to this. You have a website with a lot, a lot of this information, right, that we can learn from? I am constantly adding to my website and, you know, as more and more information comes to light, we keep adding and amending and, you know, it's this kind of boiling pot of, of um, new insights, new information that comes up. Um, right now I'm doing something that I, people have been after me to do for a long time and that is I'm doing a step by step for them going over some of the things that we went over this afternoon. Uh, you know, a detailed explanation what the birth certificate is and how it functions and how to, how to deal with that. Uh, then I'll be posting the most updated um, certificate of assumed name. Uh, if we had more money, we could do more. Uh, as it stands, we ferreted out the um, eight session laws, not the statutes the session laws uh, that govern the common law copyright of assumed names. And we found them in Alaska and, was, and uh, Washington state and a, a few other states. But um, because these are federated states, what is true in one state has to be true in the other. Okay, so you can, you can go ahead and do the claiming anyhow. Uh, so we're going to post the certificate of assumed name, the latest and greatest, and people can use that as a template. Just take out my name and, you know, redo it in the same style and use your own name and your own address and whatnot. You know, either record those or send a record copy to yourself. There are two ways of recording land jurisdiction documents. One is to record via the land recording office, okay? And the other is the post office. Now you may have noticed that land is international and soil is national. And what you wind up with is red ink instead of blue ink. Yeah. You ever notice that a postal stamp, a cancellation stamp is always red? Oh. That's a land jurisdiction. Hmm. The stamps that you see coming in off of the uh, courts, those are always blue. See jurisdiction. Uh. Okay? So anyway, when you get your certificate of assumed name done, you can take it to the local land recording office. Some of them object and won't um, record it unless it has the section law from that specific state. And you can either pay a paralegal to go dig up that session law regarding guaranteeing your copyright rights for assumed names. Or you can send yourself a record copy. I prefer to get it, get it straight, look it up the law and cite it and get it recorded in the public land recording office, which is what I did. Um, but you can also send yourself a record copy. And this applies to anything that you want to get a record of. You send yourself a registered letter. And when it comes back, you just put it in the file along with your file copy of whatever's in that letter. And if any question comes up, you certify a copy of the file copy you have. This is a true, complete, correct um, copy of, of the document, blah, blah. Signed date by Anna Maria Reisinger, 
Maiden. Yeah. And then you can walk in and you have this little envelope. And you wave it at the judge. And here I have a record copy, an unsealed record copy. You have absolute proof that you sent this and you have the registration number from the registered mailing, which is the record number, and you have the red stamp. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to any kind of altercation with the courts, that's as good as having it recorded right. at the land jurisdiction office. So if you can't get it recorded by the land recording office, um, because they're being buttheads, basically, <laughs> You can always do a registered mailing to yourself. Beautiful. There is a way. Oh, yes. Wow. Incredible information. Well, you know, we've kept it so long. I'm going to just let me end up by saying this because you, you have alluded a, a few times that there's a lot of changes coming up. And what changes are coming up? I mean, I know we could go on for another hour, but just high level changes that are coming up. Who are initiating the changes? How definite are these changes? And is there anything we can do to help? Oh, yeah. Well, the biggest change is that my husband kicked them in the pants and let them know that the supposed presumed interregnum of our government has ended and never really was. So they've just been saying and telling the rest of the world that, that our government is an interregnum. It's taking a break. It's on pause for 150 years. So, as it turns out, his ancestors are the ones that donated, I won't say donated, who they took under the fledgling republic uh, and they basically acted as heads of state and all of the great seal and all of that is under their coat of arms, under their kingship. Mm -hmm. And so he um, he just had enough of it and sent out a uh, notice that the interregnum has ended, if it ever existed, and, and issued a proclamation to go with it that detailed a lot of this. And um, so that's a big change. That's a huge change. That's noticing the world that, hey, the United States, and kicking the body politic is still here and no we haven't abandoned our land or our property or anything else and all of you grubby uh bankers and all you charlatan lawyers can just get back into your little box and stay there because we're not putting up with it anymore so the notice has been put out there has there been recognition of course so that's a big change another big change um we have explicitly stated our currency is the American silver dollar, otherwise known as the United States silver dollar. Hello. I mean, that should not be big news, but it is. Because, you know, for a long time, everybody was assuming it was the Federal Reserve note. We located the uh, record where the U.S. Navy Municipal Corporation infringed on our copyright and created a corporation called the United States of America in all caps. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, that is what they have on their Federal Reserve notes. Right. And that is their excuse for trying to charge us for all of their debts. <laughs> so we seized upon that trademark and we put it in trust and we leaned it. <laughs> nice. Um, that's a big change. So that was recorded and that's all legal and that's been put into place, okay? Stamped, <laughs> recorded, boom. And uh, let's see. Uh, so when is this going to affect or uh, the uh, common person? Individuals. You know, my neighbor. When is yeah. my neighbor going to? Believe me, as soon as you all get your paperwork in order and learn how to use it, you're, okay. going to, you're going to be driving these judges absolutely crazy. <laughs> They're going to run off the bench. All these bill collectors, the IRS, they're going to get back in their little box. 
they're going to be bang on their box. So I'm seeing, so, the, I'm seeing the IRS go back yeah, into their I box. Too, I'm actually. seeing them go back. Yeah. So this is individual empower, empowerment you're talking about. You're talking about one person at a time taking back their right. Okay. Ownership back yes. their rights. Okay. I got you. Because I, I everybody like should be responsible for their own actions. We are self-governing. That's right. Oh, you got it. Oh, I got it. Did you see that light bulb that went over my head all of a sudden? Right. It's so bright in here. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to get busy and self-govern. Oh, yeah. I got to. Well, we're getting busy tomorrow <laughs> with self-governing. I like it. Oh, Judge Ann, it's so mu thank you so much for all the information you gave us. Uh, and thank you for all your time. We, we know that you have limited time, so we really appreciate you coming in. And we'll definitely want you back on at some point. You're a breath of fresh air and you're so much knowledge and our audience is just going to love you. And we all thank you so much. Take care. I hope I helped uh, you did. Didn't confuse people too much. It seemed like you were very clear with everything. I understood everything clearly. So, and I took a lot of notes and I'll put those in the description and we'll also direct them to your website, which will be a big help. Yeah, well, I'll see if you can drum up some extra donations for us because right now we're really hard tacked and I know it's Christmas and everybody's looking at taxis and everything else, but I've got $7 in my account to take care of 20 people. Now tell, tell yeah. people how to donate. Um, I have a, uh, a PayPal account Okay. at abanavon at gmail.com. That's A V A N N A V O N at gmail.com. Okay. And I have a um, mail address, a snail mail address, and checks should be made out to Anna Maria Reisinger, which is R I E Z I N G E R, at care of post office box. 520994 in Big Lake, Alaska, 99652. And I think it's important that people know that all of this has been done out of pocket by just average Americans like yeah. that. Yeah. And you know, it's a huge expense over the years, not yeah. to mention all of the hours that have gone into this that have never been paid. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've got a, a group, the Living Law Firm, that are, there are people that have been or judges who have torn up their bar cards and said enough of this and have taken up the fight. And it's also researchers, historical researchers who've been, you know, financial auditors, and CPAs, wonderful people that have come forward and helped unravel all this and make this possible. But they've all been unpaid. Is this, is this part of the 20 people that you're talking about? Well, yeah, I've got 20 people who need help. I've got probably 150 that, you know, are like me and they're, you know, they're, they're able to do it without taking out of the kitty. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we've got some, some really bright young men who have families who, you know, are donating massive amounts of time to this. Yeah. And we need their help, but um, we can't pay them a salary. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we try to pay bills that come up. You yeah. know, we just had uh, you know a dental emergency for one of the wives. We had a child that broke their arm and needed you know money to get their arm set, and you know things like this come up. So another guy's water heater blew up. I mean, it happens to everybody, right? Yeah. Like if, if you don't have a, a a salary job if you're if you're working to to free america <laughs> yeah, yeah i get you no so, so this is what we do we we try to help them with things like light bills and and if they if they need a little extra for their food budget and things like that we don't give them a we can't afford to hire them right but uh you know we we use the donations for those kinds of expenses that we can help them with well, we have we have a good uh, we have a great subscribership, um, so we'll do whatever we can to get the message out and to help you guys. Yeah. And I wanted to, once again, I wanted to thank you for your time. I really appreciate it, uh, and thank you for all the information. Yes. God bless you, and have a great uh, holiday season.